This series is about getting inside the stuff we just can't live without. The cleaners, the cosmetics, the convenience items that we use every single day. How do these things actually work? I want to hunt down the hidden magic. I'm calling it the wonder stuff. The stuff that's doing the clever work in our most vital household essentials. I'm Jane Moore and I like to think I'm pretty good at sniffing out facts. But for this assignment, I'm going to need to call on the specialists. My little black book is bulging with the phone numbers of some of Britain's best boffins, ready to reveal what they get up to behind closed doors. We're just in a flash cycle now. And take me right out of my comfort zone. Uh, nice take, that. take it, take it. To help me uncover some mind-blowing new insights. Well, that worked. <laughs> When this mission is complete, I'm expecting to be able to hit the shops armed with a whole new perspective. Welcome to the extraordinary hidden world of wonder stuff. This time I'm digging into household cleaners. I feel pretty in the dark about what we can rely on to banish the filth. In particular, when it comes to working out so-called natural versus chemical, I haven't got a clue. But I reckon that the three items on this week's Wonder Stuff shopping list should help me find out. Yes, I'm out to pull apart three household cleaners we often associate with nature. Biological washing powder, citrus degreaser, and shiny surface cleaner. In this quest, I'm going to need some help. Luckily, I can call on my very own user-friendly scientist, Dr. Mark Miodovnik, head of the Materials Research Group at King's College London. Later, in a shameless attempt to entice me back to his flat, Mark will be cooking up a batch of natural degreaser. But before that, my hunt for what nature has to offer when it comes to that tiresome burden of household cleaning starts with this squirty bottle right here. Now, don't call me obsessive, but one thing I would personally love to know is whether there's a particular substance out there that can clean without leaving streaks. On those labels that promise a streak-free finish, there's an ingredient that I recognise from my childhood, ammonium hydroxide, which, of course, to you and I is good old ammonia. So what's an old-fashioned ingredient like that still doing in a modern product? To find out what's made this age-old substance so useful for so long, I'm consulting an age-old font of wisdom, Oxford University. Apparently, our ancestors were onto ammonia's unique powers thousands of years ago, but Professor Alan Chapman tells me it took them a long time to extract it, which is not surprising when you consider its natural source. Deer hooves. Oh, yuck. Okay. Not the nicest of things to look at. <laughs> oh dear. Yes, that really is quite unpleasant. Isn't from the it? butchers. Plainly from the butchers. Ah, okay. Yes. So, how did they get ammonia? from that? Well, of course, they would get it from that by the same way they would get it from the animal's horns. Right. And Ammonia's early name was Spirit of Heart's Horn. Bearing in mind, a deer was a heart mm -hmm. and they had horns. So, yes, it's the sort of same... So it's same a bit thing. like their nails. It's, it's the like hard the stuff, and... like nails, it's part of the hard stuff of an animal. And virtually all organic things, living beings, contain it. For instance, our hair, our teeth, our fingernails Ooh. contain ammonia. Now we know what happened to Bambi's mother. Oh, yes, absolutely, <laughs> Bambi's mother. Absolutely, what a terrible shame that. Alan's macabre recipe for pure ammonium hydroxide starts with ground-up pieces of hoof and horn, throw in some slaked lime, then add water and heat. Have a drip. We're starting to get it. Ooh, there it goes. It's coming down, of course, from inside the chamber. This is cooler in the main chamber here. So as it's cooler, it then begins to condense 
as it condenses, you get the drips. That is spirits of hartshorn. Luckily for deer, ammonia is now manufactured on an industrial scale by a different method. Using powerful electric motors by 1900, you could liquefy air and you could then let off at the right pressures individual gases, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide and so on, and then use them for chemically engineering other substances. Including ammonia. And it's funny because when I'm in my house and I'm using all of these amazing products that get things clean, I never make that connection with Mother Nature. Everything is natural in one form or another. And what we often call artificial products, such as industrial products, are just natural substances that the ingenuity of the human race has learned how to recombine in very useful ways. It's fascinating stuff, but there's something about Professor Chapman that's been troubling me. Ooh, I know what it is. I thought you were fantastic in Silence of the Lambs, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get that a lot? Oh, I know that very much. Well <laughs> I'm often mistaken by... <laughs> He looks so like Anthony Hopkins. Ah. <laughs> Ammonia is one serial dirt killer that leaves no evidence behind. But how does my ammonia cleaner simply vanish without a trace? Luckily, just a few rooms away, is Dr Matthew Lodge, another Oxford don with a keen interest in the stuff. He thinks the answer is evident in the way ammonia was once used by Victorian policemen to revive fainting ladies. These are smelling salts, uh, which used to be used as a restorative. And if you smell these, it'll give you an idea of some of the, some of the oomph and the power of this ammonia. This is safe, is it, Matt? It is totally safe, yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly, it's certainly got a kick, hasn't it? Oh, that's revived me. Well, it's obviously not a very pleasant smell. What am I recognising in that smell? Ammonia occurs in, uh, in, in the body. Like, for example, it's found in urine as urea. Right. and also in sweat. Oh, right, OK, well, that explains why I don't like the smell, then. Matt tells me that it's the ammonia gas released from the ammonia salt which irritates the nose and lungs and triggers the breathing reflex. Ammonia comes into its own by simply mixing it with water to produce ammonium hydroxide. And here's the clever part. The brilliant thing about ammonia is that as the water evaporates, the ammonia turns back into a gas and that evaporates as well. They're just not leaving any trace behind at all. Making it perfect as a streak-free cleaning agent. On this side here, we'll try our, we'll try our, uh, our, our cleaning product there. Right. And uh, this is some normal, everyday hand soap. Uh-huh. Watered uh, down, obviously. Watered down, yeah, um, from a soap dispenser. Bubbling up nicely there. Yeah. So they would certainly get rid of dirt, wouldn't they? Indeed. But, I mean, the big difference will happen when the water starts to evaporate from this because what we'll see on this side here with our ammonia-containing cleaning agent is that we start to get evaporation of the solvents right. and they're just not leaving any trace behind at all. Right. The water's evaporating, our solvent's evaporating and the ammonia is turning back into a gas and that's evaporating too. Whereas on this side, as the water starts to evaporate from our soap, Many of the uh, cleaning agents, the, the hydroxides that are used in this soap and also the surfactants will just stay behind on the glass and they'll cause the, the streaky marks. So there you go. My first all-natural household cleaning wonder stuff is a simple solution of ammonium hydroxide. It may not be in every streak-free cleaner on the shelves nowadays, but it's proved its gold standard ability to put back the sparkle to all manner of shiny surfaces. You can make your own cheap household cleaner by mixing one part Wonder Stuff ammonium hydroxide to nine parts water. If you don't mind the smell, that is. Well, I'm still waiting for the luxury Winnebago to materialise, but at least my other deal breaker for doing this programme is about to come to fruition. And that's learning what it is that makes biological washing powder work. Now, you may have gathered by now I'm no Stepford wife, but I have to say I do really rely on what's in this little box. I also want to know what's the difference between bio and non-bio? And is it the word biological in this context that holds the key to the magic ingredient? Questions, questions, time for some answers. We spend thousands of pounds on clothes in our lifetime, yet we trust what's in this box, costing just a few quid, to keep them pristine. 
Exactly how this works has always been a bit of a mystery to me, but now I'm going to find out. And there are few who know more about the inside of a box of washing powder than chemist John Pickup. He's been studying cleaning methods for nearly 30 years. Great. Oh, a man's come to do my washing. That's what I like. I've got a pile of uh, clothes I've gathered for you here. Unfortunately for me, it's back to basics and I'm doing the hard work. I would suggest we're better off doing this outside. Oh, OK. And we're going to need lots and lots of hot water. Oh, sounds like childbirth. Right, I'll get going. Yes, John wants me to see for myself how dirty clothes come clean. And that means giving me hands-on experience of what laundry day was like before washing powder. First, you need energy to loosen stains from fabric. You can bash your clothes against a rock, but really hot water is an easier way to provide energy to your wash. Ooh, bit of a yeah. facial steamer. Go and get the other one. Back then, the hotter the water, the greater the energy, the cleaner the clothes. I have to say, I'm exhausted already. Then they cottoned on that the addition of a basic soap would also help. It's like working in an Italian restaurant with Parmesan. <laughs> and for really dirty laundry, you could turn to a rather unusual stain remover. In America in the 19th century, they commonly used the pee from the pot under the bed, uh. suitably stale, uh. and, and that used to start the process of getting the stains out. Very hygienic. They used we because it contains our old friend ammonia, that fabulous natural stain remover. And without a washing machine, you had to get a lather up manually. If you were lucky, you owned a possa, which looks like it was nicked from a Dalek's face. They knew what hard work was, didn't they, in those days? That's it, I'm done with the nostalgia trip. Wash day without my mod cons is a nightmare. So what happened in the evolution of washing powder that meant we no longer had to expend so much energy? What's in my biological powder that does the job without needing boiling water? John's brought along 20-odd different ingredients to show me. Blimey, it looks like an apothecary. The old-style solid soap has gone, but there's still soap in there, masquerading under the name surfactants, plus bleaching agents. But what's this? Optical brighteners? Sounds clever. This is the optical brightening agent. What this does is actually absorb visible light and reflect out more blue light than started off. So it's not actually making the clothes whiter, it's just giving the illusion of that they're it whiter. Is, it is making them appear whiter. Modern biological powder is clearly crammed full of clever chemistry to tackle different aspects of the dirt that ends up on clothes and linen. And what about those blue speckles? I bet they're doing something pretty special. What do they to make do? It, to make it look nice, really. Is that it? Yes. That's a real surprise. So where's the wonder stuff, then? Well, John reckons he saved the best till last. Well, actually, this is really the, the magic ingredient. It's the specific ingredient for biological powder, and that is a range of enzymes. It's why you get boil wash results at low temperatures. Oh, so these are the, this is what I need to go and find out more about, then? Absolutely. I've heard of enzymes, but they're a long way off being my specialist subject on Mastermind. John assures me they're the crucial difference between biological and non-biological washing powder. And to find out more, I've set up a rendezvous in the historic city of Bath. I've come to see top enzymologist Michael Dancer. Now, apart from being an excellent word to play at Scrabble, I'm not really sure about what enzymology is exactly or what it entails, so I've got to come here, but he's asked to meet me at the Roman Baths for some reason. I've read about men like him. People bathed in the murky hot springs here for 2,000 years, but quite what that's got to do with my potential wonder stuff, I don't know. So what are we doing here? Because I was expecting to be in a very high-tech lab, if I'm honest. 
We brought you here because these hot springs, like the ones here in Bath, are absolutely ideal places from which we can obtain enzymes for your washing powders. So something in there is linked to my washing powder. I don't get that. I mean, this, to me, looks murky and a bit grubby. So in here, we yeah. have enzymes. Well, in here, you will have literally millions of organisms, millions of bacteria growing. And it's those bacteria which contain the enzymes which you use uh, for your washing powders. But they're actually secreting enzymes to digest the nutrient which is in the water, exactly the same as we secrete enzymes into our stomachs to digest our food. Those enzymes then will do exactly the same on your clothes or our clothes when we put them in the washing machine. So bacteria living in warm water, like at a natural spring, can be especially useful to harvest enzymes from. And Mike is keen to show me why. So here is a bacterium. We it's have like a, a cactus. Dust, which <laughs> we isolated uh, from one of the hot springs in New Zealand. And what I'm doing is actually growing this organism on a plate which is infused with milk protein. Oh. So there's milk in the plate. These areas here which are cloudy, that's the milk. Right. But all around the bacterium, you have a halo. That's incredible. And that halo is because what the organism is doing is producing a protease. That protease digests the protein in the milk and then takes it in for food. There it is, visible proof that these bacteria make a natural substance that actually dissolves milk. Amazing. Once identified, these enzymes can be produced on an industrial scale and used in millions of boxes of biological washing powder like those made at my next stop, McBride's in Bradford, where they supply own brand washing powder to supermarkets. Head of Laundry Development, Dr Jim Gordon, has invited me to see enzymes in action. Oh, my goodness. It's Elton John's utility room. How many machines have you got in here? That... We have 25 machines. Turns out there are three basic types of laundry stain. Number one is oily, so any type of grease. Number two is what they call an oxidizable stain, things like tea, coffee and fruit juice. And number three is a stain that needs a specific enzyme to break it down. These enzymatic stains include food, blood and grass, the ones that basic soap can't shift on its own. Jim's going to show me how a protein-eating enzyme works on a super tough blood stain. This protease, we hope, is going to get rid of the blood because of the protein element. Yes. But it'll have to do this in lukewarm 30-degree water without any soap to help either. He's going to compare this to another mini wash tub without this enzyme. Do you do the washing at home, Jim? Absolutely. Modern man. Oh, this is so good, isn't it? A man that can work a washing machine. Five minutes into our mini wash cycles, how is the blood stain faring without the enzyme? Right. So that hasn't tackled blood whatsoever. As expected, pretty rubbish. But what about the blood stain with the enzyme to digest it? Oh, oh my God, look. That's almost gone completely now. Hold those up for me. Look at that. Mightily impressive. So getting rid of food stains is clearly much more effective with our wonder stuff enzymes. 20 years ago, we would have thought cleaning our clothes effectively at 30 degrees was bonkers. But now, the hunt is on for suitable bacteria living in much colder climates. The future will be even lower wash temperatures than we have currently. And for that, enzymes will play, no doubt, a key role in us being able to achieve uh, those targets. So you're looking for an enzyme that's going to work in very cold temperatures? Ideally, I mean, we're at 30 degrees now. Uh, we'll try and get down to cold water washing. Cold water washing would certainly be a major leap forward since the days of our granny's boil wash. To me, this place really drives home the unique irony of washing powder. Here, you've got 21st century manufacturing in all its glory, with automated robots packing up the most effective laundry cleaning ingredient that we've ever seen. And yet that ingredient comes from minute living organisms that were on this planet long before you and I arrived and will probably be here long after we've gone. 
A single enzyme can speed up a staggering 10 million chemical reactions every second. So just a tiny amount of it will break up a heck of a lot of stains. Now that's what I call a wonder stuff. What I've learned so far about the things inside the powders and sprays in my kitchen cupboard has really been food for thought. And I'm beginning to realize that natural ingredients can be pretty powerful. Which is just as well, because the final household dirt buster on my Wonder Stuff shopping list has a tough job on its hands. Tackling everyday grease. When I'm cruising the supermarket aisles, I often see bottles with the rather fruity and intriguing description of citrus degreaser. Now, what I want to know is, is it the citrus that's doing the heavy lifting? My material scientist, Mark Miodovnik, reckons he's got the recipe for cooking up an answer. So I've been summoned to New Covent Garden Fruit and Veg Market at six in the morning. I knew there was a reason I never became a milkman. God, it's early. Oh. OK, Mark, it's stupid o'clock. <laughs> I've not even had a whiff of a bacon butty. This had better be good. Catch. Oh! <laughs> An orange. Um, yeah. So it turns out that you can get one of the best degreasers on the planet from the rind of an orange. Really? What, just from the peel? Yeah, just from the peel. And the fantastic thing about it is that there's huge amounts of oranges used in making orange juice all around the world. You know, everyone has it for breakfast. Mm. What happens to the orange peel actually gets made into this stuff. It's called limony. I knew when you called me here you were taking the piss. <laughs> orange peel on its own won't really shift much grease. The key is to distill out the grease-busting limonene, D-limonene to be precise, that's trapped in the peel. To do this, Mark uses a chemist's condenser. The recipe is quite simple. Peel the hard rind of some oranges, remove the pith and liquidise with a little water. Then heat the mixture up to just below boiling. But what can be so special about this when it's just a by-product of making orange juice? Limonene is a what's called a hydrocarbon. So it's it's the it's the class of the kind of places you will have met that kind of thing before is, is like petrol and diesel. You go to the diesel pump and you get a bit of oily, colourless liquid on you, and and that's very similar to limonene in its kind of feel. And in fact, limonene is also a biofuel, so you could use it in your engine if you retuned it. And, and people have been talking about using it as a biofuel in general. So it's that kind of class of thing. But it just turns out that its claim to fame, the thing it really is brilliant at, is sucking up other fats. They love to be dissolved in it. They just absolutely love it. And so, although you could use it for those other things, this turns out to be its thing it's really brilliant at. So from a source we're perfectly happy to eat, we get this extraordinary chemical. Mark's extracting it using the same process that we used to make ammonia. The steam condenses when it goes into the cold glass tube and drips down into a mixture of pure limonene oil and pure water. So here comes the drip. Oh, that's the first one. That is it. Plop. So we can see the, the layer of limonene oil on the top floating. Oh, yeah. About and two millimetres, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, that's it. If I unclip this from the retort. Now, is it hot? Uh, no. 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 Now, no. if you smell that, that will be the first clue we've got limonene. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. It's, it's slight... It, it, I mean, it's very, like, uh, very evocative of that early morning freshly squeezed orange juice. Yes. But there's so, something else about it. Yeah, that kind of rindy... That rindy, very kind mm. of high note, isn't it, on the, on the... I mean, this is how you make essential oils for um, perfume as well. Um, so I can definitely see that the, the, the layer there of... of but how, how do I know that this is going... This, that this will degrease? We've got two choices. We'll either do chemical analysis or we go and have a fry up and we and we try and clean the dishes. You're talking my language. A fry up, come on then. All right. If my husband's watching, I'd just like to point out I'm only having breakfast <laughs> with another man in the interest of science. <laughs> Let's get it on. Oh, As Mark creates a nice greasy feast to test our limonene on, I get my first chance to look around a scientist's flat. Homemade contemporary Russian folk artefacts. Do you want to come and look at my Russian artefacts? Good grief. Table by the window. Doesn't get much better than this. Right. 
This could possibly be the first time that bacon, eggs and orange juice have been used as tools of scientific research. Fantastic. My personal chef. It's time to test our precious few drops of pure limonene. Will this innocuous looking substance justify its reputation as a wonder stuff? Yeah. On the plate. Oh yeah, you can see it. You can see the oil and there's a bit of water there. Ah! Oh, look at that! That is actually quite impressive. God, that is really impressive. You're surprised, yeah. aren't you? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I have a reputation for demos not quite going to plan, but this is definitely nice. Look at that, that's pretty good. So what are these tiny drops of limonene actually doing to the grease on my plate? It's like a sort of liquid sponge. And um, this, is, this is one of the best hydrocarbon solvents. It's got a KB value of um, 67. What's a KB value? If you've got a high KB value, you're an excellent solvent for hydrocarbons. The top is toluene 105, but limonene is, is 67, which is really pretty good. If you consider that white spirits are something we think of as being absolutely brilliant on paint even, yeah. it's 37. Ah. And it just so happens that um, limonene really attracts lots of kind of oil. It, what it's doing is um, the oil on the plate is sort of sticking to the plate and quite likes being in the plate, but when it comes in contact with limonene, it thinks, oh, I would much rather be swimming around in limonene, you know, and it has a much greater affinity for the molecules. And so it, it quickly skedaddles into any drop of limonene and that then still retains its liquid nature. So then if you've got a sponge or something and you can just wipe it off and down the drain it goes. <coughs> Who'd have thought that something as simple as orange rind could give us a user-friendly cleaning agent that tackles the worst grease we can throw at it? To me, it trounces the competition because it comes from a completely renewable waste product that literally grows on trees. And best of all, it has the delicious smell of oranges. Limonene can also be extracted from lemons, as the name suggests and cleans up everything from chain oil to good old lard. It also turns up in cosmetics, food flavouring and glue. And some research even suggests that limonene could turn out to be a possible treatment for cancer. Now that really would be extraordinary stuff. Now, when I started this programme, I'll be honest with you, I didn't think that the words natural and chemical sit really in the same sentence, particularly when it comes to household cleaning products. But now I know they can. The same stuff our ancestors extracted from deer antlers is still going strong today. They're just not leaving any trace behind at all. And the breakthrough of getting clean clothes and low temperature is down to natural enzymes made by bacteria that thrive in the world's most inhospitable places. Oh my God, look. That's almost gone completely now. It just goes to show that nature really is the original mother of invention. And who knows what other miraculous natural substances are out there just waiting to make our modern lives that bit easier. Next time, I lift the lid on our household lifesavers. That is the oh. cause of the problem. Oh, yeah. I discover some crafty chemicals that clear the nasty blockages others can't reach. Look, here we go. We have lift off. <laughs> Mark attempts to win <laughs> me over. <laughs> Plastic. Oh, no. By generating electricity between us. This is it going to explode, is it? <laughs> And I endure freezing temperatures to find the remarkable bug whose blood could stop your car exploding. That is absolutely astonishing.